Now we get to one of the, the conflicts that's always really existed in derivative markets, but we've managed to kind of sweep it under the carpet up to now, which, which is that to practitioners, the risk-free rate has never really been the risk-free rate. The risk-free rate has always, for practitioners, been an estimate of their average funding cost. So if we just go back a slide, <clears throat> why is current practice to use the OIS rate for collateralized transactions? Well, because collateralized transactions are funded by the collateral. Interest is paid on the collateral and the usual arrangement in the US, for example, is that interest would be paid at the Fed funds rate, which is an o the overnight rate that's closely related to the OIS rate. So the OIS, using the OIS for collateralized transactions is just reflecting the fact that you're funding those collateralized transactions at um, a rate, at, 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 uh, typically at the Fed funds rate or the equivalent rate in other countries, and the, o the OIS rate, as I say, is the longer term rate that's consistent with the Fed funds rate. We continue to use LIBOR for non-collateralized transactions. Why is that? Well, non-collateralized transactions are not funded by the collateral. They're, um, they're funded by the banks, you know, regular market transactions. And so LIBOR is maybe an estimate of the bank's average funding cost for non-collateralized transactions. So if, so if you asked a practitioner why you use those two rates, the practitioner would talk about funding costs. And the practitioner has always said, instead of thinking, I want the best proxy for the risk-free rate, the practitioner has always thought about derivative pricing in terms of the risk-free rate being my best proxy for my funding costs. Okay, and actually I was talking to <coughs> somebody who's doing a PhD in financial history, doing it at University of Edinburgh in England, and he came over to talk to me about one or two things. And I was talking to him about this point, and he's, he's put me in touch with some very early literature on the pricing of derivatives, you know, in the very early days when people were talking about, you know, these interest rate swaps are starting to trade, how should we price them? And it's always been the case that people have been thinking in terms of their funding costs when pricing them. So all of this explains why practitioners want a funding value adjustment. Because <clears throat> as far as those non-collateralized transactions are concerned, you know, maybe we can fund them at LIBOR, that's fine. But actually, very often, we act, you know, these days, the average funding cost of the bank is LIBOR plus a spread. So we want to make an adjustment for the fact that we can't fund the transactions at, uh, at LIBOR. We, you know, we've got uh, an extra spread to take into account. And that, that explains the definition of FVA here, that it's the difference between valuing a portfolio of uncollateralized transactions using whatever you assume the risk-free rate is, which might well be LIBOR, and valuing it at the bank's average funding cost. So it's something that, in effect, increases the interest rate from uh, uh, whatever you're assuming in your models to the bank's average funding cost. <clears throat> 